No success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. That's why Club Wealth was founded, to help driven, successful, and busy real estate agents like you double their business while building a strong, balanced home life. Join us each week as high-producing agents and team leaders share their stories and unpack the principles and systems they've used to double, triple, and even quadruple their business while enjoying greater quality of life. And now, here's the latest episode of Club Wealth TV. Good morning, everybody. I think we're live. It's always hard to tell if we're live, uh, but we're going we're gonna to assume that we are actually live right now on Facebook. My name is Michael Hellickson. I'm with Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting. Note the connotation there. It's Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting for a reason. That being said, uh, we are here with my co-host, Mr. Brian Curtis, who's one of the top coaches uh, at Club Wealth. Brian is a tier five coach out of Bentonville, Arkansas, the hustling, bustling metropolis of Bentonville. And uh, if you guys haven't been there, they've got one of those monorails, you know, the buildings that look like big, you know, people in hooded armor and stuff. And no, I'm just kidding. It's not quite like that, but it's pretty awesome. It's Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, so anyway, Brian uh, last year did just over 330 transactions there. Not have no idea where he's at right now this year, what he's going to crush this year, but I imagine it's going to be even more. Uh, and then we've got Cherie Benjamin, the lioness of real estate. Oh my gosh. This woman Two years ago, it was her and a part-time assistant. Last year, she got into Club Wealth, got super serious about her production. She grew her team to 25 people and crushed 250 transactions last year. This year, was on track to do over 500 transactions. Uh, and both Brian and Shri are completely out of production. So shout out to you guys. And they're both coaches at Club Wealth. So super stoked that you guys are here. Love you guys. Appreciate all that you do for Club Wealth and for me as well. And uh, then, of course, we've got Mr. Mike Bernier. Now, for those of you that don't know Mike, Mike is not only a Club Wealth coach, uh, Mike actually runs our broker owner coaching program together with his partner, Long Doan. And uh, they own a brokerage up in uh, Minneapolis, like this really cold part of the country, uh, where essentially they're, uh, they're frozen, entombed in ice, if you will, uh, much like you know prehistoric man on Mount Everest, right? where the, literally they thaw out for about three weeks each summer and then they go back to frozen in the ice because, you know, that's Minneapolis for you. I'm totally joking. You know I love you, Mike. But Mike and Long are crushing Realtor.com leads. These guys are literally closing. Over 10% of the leads that they get are turning into closed trans transactions for them from Realtor.com. So super stoked to have Mike here to talk to us about exactly how that he's doing that. And before we get to you, Mike, I want to put a shout out to our sponsor, the people that make this show possible for us, uh, which is Wise Hire. We freaking love Wise Hire. They're a great resource. They provide a consistent source of leads for us, both for agent hires as well as administrative team member hires. So shout out to them. If you guys want to get the Club Wealth discount on Wise Hire, go to wisehire.com forward slash Club Wealth. All right. That being said, Mike Bernier, welcome to Club Wealth TV. Tell us what the heck, dude. First of all, before you get into how you're doing this, Tell us more about you and what is going on here. First off, I'm going to wear these the rest of the show to show that it's always sunny in Minneapolis in the summer. You, you can talk about the cold weather, but does this look cold to you? That's all oh I got to say. Oh, my gosh. You know, I heard that you need to wear glacier glasses because you go <laughs> so blind when the, stuff, when the sun reflects <laughs> off the snow. So Pretty I'm much. assuming that's what those are. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, but to answer your question, yeah. So uh, Long and I do run a, a large brokerage in Minneapolis, 300 agents. We've been doing this uh, traditional brokerage since 2014. We're thought of largely in part as brokers. But what a lot of people don't know is we also run a production team um, that's a lead generating team. And our primary resource in that team is Realtor.com. Realtor.com is sort of our jam. We do very well with Realtor.com. So we were asked to come in today and really talk about what's been successful and what's a little different about how we do it. I love it. And you know, you're right. It, it's a lot of people don't realize that you guys do run a successful team. So, and, and it's interesting because people ask me all the time, well, Michael, should I go into brokerage? You know, am I going to make a bunch of money as a broker? You know, I just figure I'll go hire 40 or 50 agents and I'll, you know, make a great living. It's like, dude, I got news for you. <laughs> like that is not the recipe for success. Talk to us really quick about that. And then let's jump right into the real com leads. Yeah. So, you know, the oldest adage in the, in the world is there's nobody broker than the broker, right? So, I mean, uh, making money in brokerage is really not that easy to do. It's, it's a volume game. 
whether you're a split model or not, uh, Long and I saw that there was a lot of opportunity in production for us if we ran a team alongside of running the brokerage. And on top of it, we're able to recruit for the team because we have a brokerage. We're able to take agents that we like and recruit them for the lead team. So for us, it's been a really good deal. Yeah, that's huge. Now, I know Sheree and Brian, you guys are using Realtor.com as well, right? Absolutely. So talk to us about that. Elaborate on that. What, what, what's your success fan? Why is it you feel strongly about them? You know, talk to us. So I think they're, they're a great lead source. Um, you know, we use them. I, I don't know exactly what my spend is every month, but it's, it's significant. And we're getting probably 150 leads from the month. And uh, I don't know if we quite hit 10%, um, but we definitely we're closing. I would guess we're closer to eight. But uh, so hopefully I'll learn something today as well. I'm still happy with that with that close. The thing that I love about Realtor.com leads, oftentimes you'll get a Realtor.com lead who says, yeah, I want to go see this house and I want to go see it right now. So that's, you know, that's where the money's at, because I, f- I feel like we've got to every once in a while give our agents those deals that they can go. Oh, great. I can just run out and, cl- and get this right now. They love that because, you know, we're asking them to do a lot of stuff. We're asking them to get on the phone for two to three hours a day and, and grind through the old stuff. So every once in a while, a, a low hanging, I want to go see a house this afternoon is, is really nice. And, and realtor.com provides quite a few of those. Yeah. And Shree, how about you? Um, yeah. So kind of echoing exactly what Brian said. So I don't know exactly off the top of my head what my RDC spend is, but um, it is nice that they do get those that's I want to see one, two, three Main Street. It's up to the agents to then say, okay, I'm going to go show you one, two, three Main Street and not jump into that. Are you pre-qualified yet? I don't know if I want to get up and go do this and all of that jibber jabber that we hear, but it's, it's very simple as to go show it. You got a house that you want to buy a house. I want to sell you a house. Let's get on top of it. And realtor.com does get you to those people who are that 3% just like that. So works out really well for us. Is jibber jabber like the technical term? Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, that, that's, awesome. Like... <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so Mike, let's get right into this. Walk us through, you know, how you're getting this high conversion rate. Start from the very beginning. Lead comes in. You know, for, actually, let me back up. First of all, start with what what zip codes you're buying in terms of, you know, are you buying zip codes all over the place? Are you focused on just a narrow subset of zip codes? Are you concerned about price point? Uh, then let's go into specifically how are you handling the leads as they come in? Gotcha. So, you know, first off, let me walk you through really how the leads break down because the zip codes play into that. Number one, we buy about 400 to 450 leads a month. We've got 13 people on the team. Out of those 450 leads a month, about 150 of those are not really leads or duplicates. They've entered, you know, four, they've clicked on four or five different properties. It's the same person. Uh, it's false information. It's something that does does not really qualify as a real lead. We break down to about 300 real leads per month. That's about our average. We spread those leads across multiple zip codes. We have what we call a seven county metro area here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we've got a presence um, for our leads in every single one of those seven counties because we have agents that will work any of those counties. Now, We've got higher price points. We've got lower price points. Uh, We did that to diversify. Kind of like if you're buying stocks, you know, or mutual funds, you want to diversify. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. That was our philosophy is we wanted to diversify among smaller and first time home buyer, you know, markets as well as uh, move up first, second, third, you know, move up buyers and sellers. Um, So that's how we we saw it rolling out. Um, Now, when the lead started, you know, when we first started this little lead team, I want to make one important distinction. We didn't buy 300 leads day one. We bought only enough for agents to handle. We wanted to make sure that we didn't overwhelm agents with leads or spoil them with the fact that, you know, hey, uh, I don't want to take this lead because it's only a $100,000 condo. Uh, and our average sale price, by the way, in our metro area is about $290. Um, but we didn't want to spoil people where they would refuse lower end stuff or harder stuff because they knew that four other leads were coming around the corner. We wanted to make sure from day one that we gave the appropriate amount of leads to each agent. That's been one of our secrets to success right there. So when you say the right number of leads to each agent, I want to hear from each of you. How, how many leads are you giving each agent each month? Because, because I, I have a feeling it's a smaller number than what most people think. Yeah, I think for my team, they get probably for new leads, they get about 25-ish, 30, something like that. So it's, it's not good. 60, 100. I mean, because I hear a lot of people thinking they got to provide 60 to 100 leads to their agents, which seems like an No, option. I mean, there's a compound effect to that. And I think people forget about that. 
that if I give you 25 now and I'm giving you 25 again, and now you're out and you're showing and you're working with these people, how are you getting to the next? Let's, let's fast forward this to six months down the road. So I coach a lot of people who then say, my agents have three, 400 leads in their, in their pipe and they're not calling them all. Well, you're giving them too much. That's why. Let's shift this over to some people who can, um, who can do that. So no, it's not, it's not there. But we also give access to a pond. So when you're brand new, you can go and, and call into that, that pond account to start getting your numbers up if that's what you're choosing to do. And most of them do choose to do that because like, you know, I don't flock with turkeys. So <laughs> can I, I, love the, yeah. I love the reference to eagles don't flock with turkeys. That's awesome. Uh, can, can I interject something too? So one thing I thought that was really important about uh, Sheree's um, comment there too, with, with trying to determine which agents or, or how many leads each agent gets. One thing that I found extremely successful for us is our ISA, our appointment center, the one that actually converts the leads. We separated conversion into two different, um, uh, two different types of conversion. One, converting from phone call to appointment. That's all the ISA. And then from there, converting from the appointment to closing was really the agent. But the ISA that we've got knows our agents really well. They work very close as a team. They know everybody's business. They know if that agent, you know, supplements their business with our leads or if that's their primary for their business. And there's a big distinction there because not every agent's going to handle the exact same volume the same way. And if you know people's breaking point in their threshold, you can manipulate that very easily if you're good with the, if you're a good ISA. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And they're careful about when, you, when if you're, by the way, for those of you that are running the ISA model, don't be afraid to give your, your ISAs the ability to pick and choose which agents are going to get which leads, how many leads, et cetera. Because the reality is that that really is a model that allows you to reward the people that are doing the best. And that's the people you want to reward. You don't want to give the best leads to the guy that's got a one in 10 close ratio or, or a, I should say a, a, a one in a hundred close ratio. You want to give them to the guy that's got the one in 10 close ratio. Uh, and uh, we also want to say, you know, we're, we're pretty careful at, uh, you know, with our ISA, he's one of the team. I mean, we'll do happy hours with them and lunches with them and we'll do events with them. He's, he's really one of the flock, one of the pack. So he knows those agents very well. And he also knows their personalities well. So when he's on the phone with the lead, it's not just a round robin who's up next for the lead. He's going to match by personality who he thinks is going to be the best fit for that lead as well. And that's been extremely successful in making sure that the, the buyer moves forward. Because what happens generally is you'll see that even if you've got a good ISA, they'll get the appointment. They'll go meet the agent and all of a sudden there's never anything that'll happen after that. The lead goes dark, they go away, um, you know, and then the agent scratches her head and goes, you know, it was a bad lead, I've got to move on. Well, really it was a bad pairing from the start. So we're pretty careful on that too. That's huge. Okay, so Brian, really quick, how many, uh, how many leads are you providing your team with each month, each team member? So um, I would say the minimum that somebody gets is about 40, but we have a lot of incoming phone calls. And so it varies significantly on the incoming phone calls because those get added to people um, as they, you know, as the incoming phone calls come in. So, and those aren't a first come first serve. So the phone rings and everybody gets an opportunity and whoever gets it first gets it. So that part varies quite a bit. Some people are very on top of that. Some people aren't. Um, yeah, it, it really, it, it varies, but we get about 40. Okay. Now you have also gone through the process of, you know, you literally people were saying, well, I'm not getting those calls and they would get frustrated because they thought that, you know, somebody else was getting a head start on some of those inbound calls. And I remember one time, didn't you take everybody's phones and put them on the table and you tested it and t tell us what happened there. So it's interesting. So there was a gentleman on our team who was getting probably 50% of the calls and there's, you know, he was competing against 12 to 13 other people. So everyone assumed that his phone was ringing first and his phone actually rang third when we did that. So um, that is something that's interesting about call blast. We have not been able to figure out a way to truly make it 100% simultaneous. I'm experimenting with some ideas like maybe we'll have team A or team B and that's not a reflection on their quality. Just, you know, you get, you can be on calls this week if you're on team A and then team B will be on next week. I'd like to get it spread out a little bit more because I feel like, um, you know, if one guy's getting 75 leads and the next person's getting 50 leads, that maybe that's not the, 
the best cheese. I don't feel like someone can handle 75 leads a month. And we have, we've actually had people get that many. And uh, so I've had to work through that. You know, the flip side is no matter what on incoming phone calls, I want 100% of those answered basically from eight to eight is kind of our rule. So in, and we'd come pretty close to that. So people have realized, and if you, if you don't hear anything else today, realize this incoming phone calls in 2018 are gold. I laugh at people who spend two and three hours a day on the phone trying to get a hold of people. You know, I spent three hours on the phone this morning and I called a hundred people and I spoke to 10 people. Great. And then when the phone rang with an incoming phone call, they were too busy. So um, it's kind of a kind of a little bit of an irony. You spend hours trying to get somebody on the phone. Someone calls you and you're too busy. That's crazy to me. Well, and frankly, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people go to the ISA model, right? Because, the, you know, they get to that point where their agents just, for whatever reason, aren't following up with people or they're, you know, they, they say they don't have time to follow up with people. So the, the reality, though, is it's tough. Like doing the ISA model is really a commitment. Like you don't do it with just one ISA. Because if you have one ISA and they have a bad day, week, or month, all of a sudden your whole team is having a bad day, week, or month. So it's important that if you're going to do this, like everything else in your company, you want to have more than one pig at the trough, right? And, and some people hate this analogy, but the reality is the pig at the trough analogy essentially is, you know, if, if I've got one pig at the trough, they'll eat the food and they'll get fatter and eventually I'll get bacon. But if I have two pigs at the same trough, they'll compete for the food. They'll both get fatter faster and I get bacon sooner and way more of it. So uh, there's reasons why it's, it, you know, it's, it's better for everybody to have more than one pick of the trough. So speaking of which, Mike, now you are running the ISA model, right? Yes. Good. All right. So walk us through the process. Sure. So with the ISA, um, like I mentioned before, we've got really two dip- different types of conversion. Um, on our viable leads that are not duplicates, that are not, you know, uh, you know, the same person clicking on three or four different properties, our ISA is converting 70% of those from phone call to appointment. And the reason why is because he's extremely good at what he does. We do a lot of training with him and he's got a lot of experience. He's been with us now three years. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when he started out, he did not hit those numbers. And we pulled him from a different industry of appointment setting. He was working with the financial planning uh, uh, community, setting appointments for financial planners. So it was a transition from appointment setting from one industry to another, which, you know, a lot of people look for ISAs that are in the real estate industry that are either failing as agents or, you know, or looking for part-time work. I steered away from that. We looked for somebody that was already high level in appointment setting and taught them real estate. Um, so they're setting 70, he's 70, 70, 70%. And I have not found a duplicate ISA, a, a backup yet that could set the numbers that he does. So I'm still looking. I agree with you. I think more than once a good idea. I just haven't found the talent yet to, to you know, really duplicate him. So once he gets the appointment set, what he does is he's going to match them with the perfect agent. He's going to have the agent on the phone with them immediately. Now, as you know, with realtor.com, you're not the only agent calling. You're not the only ISA calling. So having multiple members of your team talking with this individual, um, that's very important. So our ISA knows keep that person on the phone. Even if you set the appointment in the first 10 seconds, keep them on the phone for three to five minutes if you can, because we all know what's happening in that first three to five minutes. They're getting blasted with other agents and other ISAs. So immediately after the appointment set in the ISA has everything rolling, he's going to do a connection with the agent. The agent's going to immediately call to introduce themselves to the lead, to the prospect, to the buyer, seller, whatever it is, and they're going to have a conversation. Now, in that conversation, there's going to be a couple phases of it. We're going to end up you know, doing what we first call the intro phase. We're going to make sure that we intro ourselves correctly. The ISA is very good at this. And in that intro, what he's not going to do is say, hey, I'm a... I'm calling uh, to set an appointment with you in a house where I'm a realtor. He's in a call saying, hey, I'm responding to an inquiry on XYZ Main Street. Was that you? And they're going to start this an intro on the property. They don't want to start it out as a sales call, but more of a response. It's a courtesy call to respond to your inquiry through realtor.com. We've had a much better you know, uh, test with that. It tests out much better. Then we're going to go into the rapport phase, rapport and discovery phase. And there's two questions that the ISA asks that have been extremely helpful to learn all the things about the buyer that they don't just come out and say all the time. Question number one is after we go through the intro phase of, you know, uh, do I have the right person? You inquired next XYZ Main Street, how can I help you? And that one question of how how can I help you has been instrumental for us to learn about what they're really calling on. What we saw was agents reading down a rap sheet on properties. Like 
hey, XYZ Main Street listed for 300,000, you know, four bedroom, three bath. And it's things that don't resonate with the buyer necessarily because it's not relevant. They might already know that information. What they're really calling about is, is it still available? Why has it been on the market for, you know, for 50 days when the other ones are selling in, in you know, 15 minutes? Would the seller take a lower price? Are you the listing agent? They might have a, a slew of different things they want to talk about that have nothing to do with the metrics of the house. So that question of how can I help you opens up the conversation for the ISA to let them actually talk and learn about the motivations and the hot buttons of the buyer. Second question, second side of that coin, if it's a two-sided coin, that's what we call it, uh, is what attracted you to the property? And what we learn in that, it could be, you know, hey, I grew up in the neighborhood. It's five minutes from work. I need a bigger house for extending, expanding household, whatever it is. But the point is, is our ISA is extremely good at um, making sure not to assume anything about the buyer, but to ask really, really good questions in order to learn more about the buyer. And there's a reason for that. And I'll touch on that in a minute, because it's not just about setting the appointment in that house. There's a lot more that really goes into it. So when we're learning about the buyer, we're learning about their hot buttons. We're learning about what motivates them where they're going to ask us questions. You know, what's the price of the property? And I've seen agents make this mistake a lot of times. Well, the price is $300,000. Thank you. Click goodbye. So the rhythm really is answer a question with the question. The price is $300,000. Is that the price range you're looking at? Even if they say no, it still opens up for more dialogue. So our ISA is really good at asking good questions and leading people, not controlling a conversation, or sorry, dominating conversation by talking too much, but controlling it by asking questions and listening. So his general rule of thumb is talk 30% of the time, listen 70% of the time, because when you're listening, you're learning where to steer that conversation, what's relevant and important to that buyer. Now, um, another thing that'll happen in that discovery phase is we're going to learn about misconceptions. Oh yeah, the house is, you know, it's over, it's more than I'm willing to spend. Uh, well, it's $300,000. What price range were you looking at? Well, I was looking up to two seventy. dollars Well, our, our ISA is really good at handling those kind of situations to talk about what led that person to the $270,000 number. What led you to that number? Well, I, you know, I looked on, online and that's what I'm qualified for. Or the lend, a lender gave me that as my pre-approval. Okay, what numbers did they use to estimate taxes, insurance, and interest rate? Well, I don't know. Well, great. Let's explore that. We've gotten more appointments from that one scenario that I can even tell you. Because we don't just say, uh, you know, when they ask, what's the price of the property? 300 grand. Okay, thank you. Bye. Click. We actually talk to them. That leads them down the pathway to us learning a lot more. And the reason we want to learn more is because uh, one thing we do is when we set that appointment, we also pull alternative properties. So we don't want to show just that property. One thing that we do, because we know that less than 5% of the time, they're actually going to buy the property that you go show them. It doesn't matter if it's sold under contract. Uh, if it's pending inspection, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We're still going to do as much as we can do to set that appointment and go show that house because we know they're not going to buy it anyway. It's rare. But if we have alternative properties that they didn't find themselves that we found, now all of a sudden we have value. It wasn't them coming to us with something. It's us bringing something of value to them. And that's been largely in instrumental. Uh, another part of our conversation we always like to ask is, there, is there anybody else we could extend the invitation to the showing? What we're really looking for is, do we have any influencers or decision makers we have to worry about? Is dad going to be a decision maker in the, in the process? If so, let's invite him in the first showing. Do you have a, a boyfriend, a husband, a spouse, something that's going to uh, you know, be uh, a trigger that we should probably invite an influencer or decision maker? So in those kind of uh, conversation pieces, the flow and the anatomy of the call, we've been successful to set 70 plus percent of every phone call, it's a viable lead to an actual appointment. So that's our first step in conversion is getting the appointment and getting them there with an agent. I mean, so let, me, like ahead, okay. let me ask you this. So lead comes in, what's the speed to lead? 18 seconds on average for us. So then I couldn't hear it, sorry. So then we'll average, 18 seconds. Okay, 18 And I sat there with a, literally a stopwatch and, and, and went through this on average. There's, I mean, let's be honest, a lead might come in when he's, when ISA or somebody's on the phone already. So you might have to have a backup solution for that, where you can kind of disperse to, uh, to the group. Um, but overall, you know, we'll be at 18 seconds. There's times we're within two seconds, but we've averaged at 18 and that's super okay. important. Because and that, that's a, that's a big number. That's, that's a, the key there that I want to make sure that people are hearing because not everyone has the ISA model, but 
just about all everyone is an agent who's listening to this or has agents, you know, that are that are receiving these types of leads. And it is the speed to lead. You know, so as soon as it comes in, you're immediately on the phone because and I'm sure that this has happened with your ISA that his, the phone is ringing with other agents that's calling at the same time as to why while he's on the phone. That's why you guys have had this it's extended time of this, at least that five minutes that you're trying to keep them on the phone for. That's exactly Tell me this. Tell me this. So when we have someone who doesn't have the ISA model, who is just this, who's their team members are the ones that are calling. What else are you all doing besides the phone call? So we know that the, that the phone call is very important. Are there text messages going out for someone who you don't get? Is there emails that are going out? What else are you all, is your ISA doing that agents can adapt to doing also? Yes. It's a good question. So number one, I'd like to point out too that you're absolutely right about speed to lead. That's huge. But even if we're not first, a lot of times we will end up with the appointment because I'll be honest with you, a lot of agents suck at conversion. They'll get on the phone with somebody and not get the appointment. So it doesn't scare me if we're not first. I like to be first, but if we're not, we're still going to shoot for that appointment. So we all know that, I shouldn't assume we all know, but we, we all know, we should all know that if you don't connect with them, the chances of connecting them with them after five minutes goes down significantly. 900%. Yeah. And if you go, if you go an hour, you're like 10,000% chance of not getting a hold of them. Right. So um, what we do, and I think club well teaches this really well. And the follow-up is the three times three rule of keep following up. If you don't get a hold of them, keep following up three times a day for the first three days, three times a week for the next three weeks and three times a month for the next three months keep following up. So that's crucial. We will pick people up on the back end that way too. Um, but to answer your question, Sheree, what are some things you can adapt? And I'll tell you this right now, don't always assume just because you're not the first that you can't get the appointment. Also, once you talk to them, one of the biggest lessons I learned was once you're on the phone with them and you set that appointment, they might not remember who you are. So the next agent that calls, they might think that agent's part of your team or you again. Make a very clear distinction that if anybody else other than myself and or so-and-so calls, it's not us. And if you're looking at other properties, tell me which ones you like so you don't have to go through this process again. Just tell me now, I'll pull up the info for you now so you don't have to get bombarded with more agents. You're dealing with us now. Anybody else that calls, not us. We got you. Uh, we did not make that distinction early on. We kept losing people because, I mean, literally we had agents show up at a showing. The buyer would show up and there'd be two agents because they set the appointment with two different people. How awkward is that, Right. So we've been pretty careful now on that one. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, Mike, here's a quick question for you. So using the ISA model, obviously the ISA doesn't go and meet them. Obviously the ISA doesn't know every single agent on your team's schedule. Um, tell Correct. me what, how you feel about setting an appointment and then dealing with the consequences of that. It's Yeah, I love it because it's easier once you set the appointment to reschedule it. Then to awesome. screw around, you know, trying to, I'll, I'll find somebody to get back to you. I'll set it and we'll find somebody. With 13 people on the team, we're going to find somebody. Another reason I like having the brokerage here is we got pinch hitters. If somebody, if like literally all 13 people on a holiday weekend can't show a house, I'm going to find somebody in the brokerage that will fill in for at least one showing. So we've had to do that before too. But it's so much easier to reschedule somebody after that appointment set than try to get back to them. Once you get off the phone with them and they don't have it in their mind, they're meeting you it's hard to get them back. Yeah. And, and I've actually, you know, it's so funny agents for the, the people who don't have an ISA model. So you're an agent driving down the road, you take a realtor.com phone call. You don't have the MLS. You, you can't figure out that house is available. Set the appointment because again, if you tell them, well, unfortunately it's not available, but let me go and, you know, or, Hey, let me call you back in 10 minutes and see if I can find out if that's available. Just set the appointment. I don't even care if the house exists. You know, I, I've done that before where it's a new construction house. And I'm like, absolutely, I'll meet you there at 10 o'clock. And I realize that literally it's a to be built, doesn't even exist, but that's okay because I can call that person back and 100% of the time they'll answer the phone versus the seven or 8% of the time the person who you, you know, are going to call back will do. So, you know, I think that's brilliant. I'm glad you guys are doing it. I figured you probably were, but yeah. set an appointment, you know, it's easy to change something and people will answer their phone if they're like, Oh crud, this is, this is something important. Maybe the house isn't available. Maybe he's not available. They don't want to waste their time. They'll answer your call. So 
Yeah, and I think yeah. there's just a mental thing that happens that once they set the appointment, they're further in the tunnel with you. In their mind, they're meeting you, they've committed to it on some level, and it's a lot harder for them to break that. Now, back to Sheree's question of some things you can adopt as an agent, the speed to lead thing's really hard because as you get busy, and this is what you'll deal with on your team, as your best producers start getting busy, it gets harder to load them up because they're already, they're already loaded. So, you know, the same thing will happen. Realtor.com will almost put you out of business uh, with realtor.com because you start ramping up. If you're good, you can't take any more leads anymore because you're loaded. So um, to Brian's point, I think you made a point about having two separate teams. We do that. We've got what I call the A team and then we got our B team. Our A team takes about 70% of our volume. That's five of 13. Those, those are primary. That's realtor.com is our primary source of income. That's really what they do. The rest of them have another business. I mean, they're doing good with their sphere of influence or whatever, and they just supplement with our leads. So I've been pretty careful to say our A team gets most of the stuff, but in a, in a pinch or in backup or when we're loaded, when our best converters are loaded up, we'll move over to B team and start loading them up. So it goes about, um, you know, three to one on that, maybe four to one if the numbers work that way, like four leads to the A team, one to the B. So the B team are still getting opportunity, just not at the same at the same level. So if I'm you, Sheree, if I'm a, or to your question, Sheree, if I'm an agent that is not part of an ISA model, if I'm a lone ranger, one of the first things I'm going to adopt is I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm going to set a, a commitment in my mind when the phone rings. I don't care what I'm doing at that moment. I'm stepping out to take that call. If I'm on a phone call with a buyer that needs to close in 20 minutes, I'm going to say, I tell you what, I got to call you right back because all I'm going to do is I'm going to set the appointment with that realtor.com lead and I'm going to come back to it when I got a minute. But once again, once you talk to them and set the appointment, it's easier to come back to them later than not at all. So, I think a lot of people forget that the point of the phone call is to set the appointment. It like is. That's the whole reason for the phone call is to just set the appointment. Period. One thing that I want to make sure that people, everyone heard was this was the what you call the discovery phase, because we get a lot of. Uh, leads that come in where the house is not available. It's just a piece of dirt, like Brian said, <laughs> or it's it's currently under contract. It just closed, whatever that might be. But that discovery phase helps so that you're now, not only are you keeping them on the phone even longer, you're building rapport with them. You're starting to build up that no like trust, you know, that's, that's getting there. You're talking on things that you guys have in common, but I'm also finding out School, what's important to you? Schools are important to you. It's not the schools. My mother-in-law is moving in with me. She's got to have a, I have to have a bedroom on the first level. That house might not have it. So when I go show this to you or I meet you there, I have other things. And one thing that I hear a lot of, we've heard this a lot. When we started doing this, we started adapting this, I don't know, maybe um, probably about a year or so ago, we started going more in depth when we get these phone calls. And what we heard so many times was my agent, whoever it was that they thought they was working with, never showed me houses. It was always what I chose. Correct. That's what they showed. But when I go to that very first appointment and I showed you this one, but I also listened to what you said and I had two or three other ones lined up for you, I've now set myself above all of what the other agents that you've met before in the past or what you've heard of before in the past, I've set myself higher than them. So Dan Baltzer, another club wealth coach, I tell this story, he's also out of my office for most of you guys know that. Uh, a few years ago, we call it alternative properties, right? Don't just show up. In fact, we pretty much phrase it this way in our conversation. Uh, Sheree, we're going to meet you today at three o'clock. Great. By the way, I'm going to bring two or three other properties just for comparison's sake. Now, not just to show you, but just for comparison's sake, I'll have it set up. If you love the subject property we're seeing, great. We'll take a look at these other ones. See, you know, for comparison's sake, make sure the seller's being honest with the price. Make sure it makes sense. Awesome. If not, we're maximizing your time. If you don't like that house, we're still going to maximize your time and have three other ones for you. Now, Boltzer, a couple of years ago, went and showed a condo. They hated it, but because it was really in bad condition and bad decorating. He walked across the hall to a different one he had set up and sold that second one. Didn't even tell him that he was going to do it, but he sold that second one that day. So they showed up not realizing they had another one available. So he's like, no, no harm, no foul. I know this one doesn't fit your palate. Let's go across the hall because I did on your behalf set this one up too. They were so excited they had another option and they bought that house that day. And we have multiple stories like that in our office that we've done. So that alternative property piece is huge. And I want to touch on one thing that you just brought up, Sheree, too. You talked about having value. You mentioned the school district, right? If let's say schools are important to somebody. 
So one of the tactics, what we've done is we branded multiple tactics to, for training for our agents. Because remember, there's conversion to appointment to um, to appoint, or there's phone call to appointment, then there's appointment to closing. Our agents, because we're in an ISA model, they really only deal from appointment to closing. So we talk about conversion tactics from there. So one of the things that we do when a lead goes dark or disengages, we got multiple tactics in order to try to bring them back. One of them is what we labeled as a nugget. We label as a, we label them as a name so agents can remember it. They can draw upon it. Once a nugget, and that is, you know, a text of something that's pretty important. Like, hey, you know that school district information that you mentioned you like. I just pulled a ton of stuff and I found something really interesting in there. Call me back right away. So we're getting engagement. Of course, it doesn't work every time, but we're getting engagement because we remember we write down what's important to them, what their hot buttons are, and when they disengage from us, we'll go back and draw on that in order to get them to resurface. And that does work from time to time. Yeah. There's a lot of techniques that work for nudging that client back into uh, existence, if you will, yep. or back into activity. Uh, really quick, before we continue on this track, and I love where we're headed with this, but we've got some great questions from people that are watching us live right now. And by the way, for those of you that are watching live and asking questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. We love this. Uh, one of them you already answered, Brian, and that's what, you know, what do you do if the house is already sold? And I love your technique on that. It's like freaking set the appointment anyway. I don't care if the house exists. Just set the freaking appointment. We'll deal with the rest later. But once you've got that tiny commitment out of them to set the appointment, it's a lot easier to change or alter or amend uh, the discussion at that point in time. So fantastic on that. Michael, can I, can I interject one thing on that too? Because yeah. uh, there's, there's another side of that because it will happen from time to time that they will know when you talk to them that the house is already sold. We've ran into that too. It's not where you just set it and you, they find out later. But also there's times they'll approach you like, oh, you know what? I just saw that this thing was sold or under contract. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's worked really well for us too is to point out that, you know, up to 30% of these that go sold also come back on market. And then if we position ourselves right with a, with a proper backup offer, we can help coach another side through getting rid of the other buyer if a problem happens. So we have, and we've tracked this in our office, about a 30 to 35% fall through rate that we're able to interject our offer in there and our interest in there and end up with that property. So we try to keep things hopeful and moving forward, even if they know it's not 100% available. That's golden. I love that. That's huge. Uh, all right. So another one, uh, Mike Novak, uh, and by the way, for those of you, and by the way, it's great to see you, Mike. I appreciate you watching today. For those of you that don't know Mike Novak, second year in the business, he's going to net over a million dollars this year. He's a club wealth coaching client. Uh, freaking love Mike and Rachel over there. They're killing it. Uh, up, Mike? Mike, Mike mentions that uh, they literally, he just had an agent just the other day that literally contacted a person 23 times before finally getting a hold of them and setting the appointment. Agents give up too early. Not only do you have to have speed to lead, but you've got to be tenacious about your follow-up. If you're not tenacious about your follow-up, you're throwing money away. And so Sheree, you mentioned earlier that, you know, when you give agents too many leads, they don't follow up as tenaciously as they should with the leads that they have. And it's so true. And that's money that's falling through the cracks. That's money that needs to get back to the bottom line of the company. Let me tell you this, Michael, I looked um, in our system and um, we had, I want to say it was probably two weeks ago. We had a lead that had came in 584 days ago. And when I looked at it, it was nothing but attempted contact the entire time, except for the, the agent that did contact them, that finally got them on the call. 584 days ago is how long that lead had been sitting in our system until it closed out. Um, mm -hmm. That's a long time. So it's, it's big time, big time, big time follow up. And um, some of these people, the, the funny thing is that some of these people, they'll come in and they give you that they do know. So, so Mike, they'll come in and they do know that the house is already under contract or something like that. And their phone is blowing up because no, you're not the first person that they spoke to. And they'll just give you the, Oh, you know, I already have an agent. Oh, I got an agent already. Something of that nature. So talk to us about what your, I know what, what we're doing, but tell us about what you, your ISA is saying to those that say I already have an agent. Gotcha. So one thing we'll make a clear distinction on is if they have an agent working with an agent or if they're actually signed with an agent, because those are There's two a difference. very distinct, you know, differences there, right? So we'll hit it on the head. You know, we'll be like, hey, are you just calling today because your agent's not available? Is that what's going on? And a lot of times we're like, yeah, the agent, my agent's out of town. We had one that was out for deer hunting one time. Um, this agent was out deer hunting and their client was, that's big in the Midwest, by the way. <laughs> Uh, their client was here calling on their own property. So they were not signed under contract and people, 
Uh, people can say what they want. I've gotten some negative feedback because we push this um, because they think it's interfering with relationships. But if you're not signed under contract, we will show you that house. But we will also make an upfront uh, handshake deal saying, look, if we happen to get a deal on this house, the assumption is you're going to work with us. Is that correct? Well, yeah, you know, that's fair. If, if we like this house and want to write on it, we'll work with you. Great. Awesome. We'll show the house under that, under that circumstance. Will they always honor that? No. Will agents get burnt? Yes, they will. But our, we'll send our best agents in there that are really good at converting people on the spot. When I mean converting people, rapport building, like relationship building, they're going to, we're going to get our best, most likable agent out there to try to build a relationship on site to try to steer that client away. Now, has that worked every time? No, I'm not going to say there's a super high conversion to that. But for an agent that's doing nothing anyway, go show the house because you don't know what's going to happen from beyond there. And most agents are not that good. Let's just face it. They're not that good. It's not hard to trump them in service or value if you just get in front of that client. And know your numbers. So that's a thing. So when we go out and, and we do the same thing, and if someone says that they have an agent, but there's no written commitment and okay, well, we'll show you this one house. Um, but when I get there, I'm going to know my numbers. So already knowing that should, should elevate your brain to knowing I've got to step my game up when I go meet with this client. So know what's going on in that neighborhood. Ask those same questions. That's not going to keep me from asking my discovery questions. I'm still going to find that out you know, from them. And then when I get there, I'm going to talk to them about, you said school district. Okay, well, this school district was rated a number, blah, 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 whatever that might be. This is the areas that you should look in for your price range. These are the neighborhoods. Um, I'm going to talk to them about more than just that one because most agents are just door openers. They, That's they all are. they are. And they're sitting around and they're waiting for their client to say, I want to buy 456 Main Street. That's so what they're doing. One thing to add to that too is the alternative property piece in that scenario is extremely important because if you're bringing them properties that their agent did not show them or they didn't even know existed, and you might cast a wider net. They might say, I'm looking up to 300. You bring one at 302. And now that's something they haven't seen before. And they're like, how come I haven't seen this thing? My agent never showed it to me. You can start casting doubt, um, not by saying, well, your agent should have showed you this, but literally by saying, I set these up on your behalf just in case you didn't like this one so we could look at others today to maximize your time. Uh, that's been huge for us. And you're absolutely right. Uh, with, with agents not really performing at a high level, you can walk in there and you can impress somebody and end up working with them. We've had it happen a number of times. You know, here's the thing. You always have another property. It doesn't matter, right? There's always no. something else. And this is where off-market property lists really come in handy. Uh, people always want what nobody else has and what they can't have, right? So having that off-market property list is a big deal. This is going to get especially important as we transition into another REO market, which a lot of people do want to say, oh, that's not here yet. And let's not go there. But, you know, here's the reality. The reality is in a lot of markets, the shift is already happening. Talk to anybody in Southern California. Uh, we've got a call coming up with Mike Bjorkman uh, here. I don't know if it's this week or no. I think it's next week, actually, uh, where Mike's going to share statistics with us that show that that market shifting. Well, guess what? When you have additional properties, particularly stuff that's not on the market, particularly if you've got REO or short sales or some of this other stuff, people want that stuff because they perceive that they're going to get a better deal. Whether they do or not, their perception is, I'm going to get a better deal if I can get access to that. So uh, what, one yeah. thing too I'd like to add is uh, what we like to do is bring sold properties for the last year. And what we do is we, we position it like, well, for what you described that you like, here's you know, 5, 10, 18, whatever it is. Uh, properties that may have fit, which ones would you have liked? And especially if they would have liked like four of them, we'll say, well, that, that's an average of like one every three months. Are you comfortable with that pace or how are you conducting your search? And we'll start recrafting a search, widening the net and giving them other options that they didn't know was there because we start going, we start casting doubt on their own, uh, you know, um, success that they might have with their method. So, you know, another thing we can do in that situation when somebody doesn't have an agent or already is working with an agent. You know, it's interesting uh, as you talk about showing them properties that have already sold, it's an interesting technique for if there's things that would be outside of the range they would have normally searched for, right? Yep. Because if, if you've got a property that otherwise is really awesome for them, uh, but it wouldn't have matched the parameters they originally gave you, and then you can show it to them and they're like, oh, yeah, I would have loved that. Well, then it's like, well, hey, look, you know, you wouldn't have got this on your search, and here's why. We really need to be talking about what's really important to you so I can get you everything. It's real easy for you to hit delete, but you can't hit delete on something you don't even get exposed to. 
And one thing that we didn't touch on yet, but I think it's one of the most crucial pieces to this. And I can't believe I'm waiting until 10 minutes for the hour because this is super important. But one thing we see a lot of is agents that are not good at converting to their lender. Our ISA is good. I mean, he's super good at it. And the reason why it's important is this. If you let them find their own lender, that lender has relationships with other realtors and they're right. being pressured to, for referrals constantly. And when a, when, a, when a buyer goes dark and just disappears on you, I can almost track it back to 50% of the time is because some lender pulled them away from you into some other referral source. So if you're really, really good when it comes to financing, when having that conversation early, not on the phone, not while you're setting the appointment, but have the conversation when you're meeting them. And we like to position like this way, you know, so Michael, uh, generally there's three ways people buy properties. They either get a mortgage, buy in cash or get a gift or a combination of some of those. Where do you fall in? Well, I need a mortgage. Have you started that process? Yes, I have. Awesome. Let me do you a favor. I'm going to have our guy give you a call because we're going to have our guy help you leverage his numbers to get a better deal from your guy or girl or whatever. And we do it. We position it more from we're going to help you out than we want your business. What happens is our lender gets on the phone and finds out that, you know, Rocket Loans is not going to answer their phone at uh, Rocket Mortgage won't answer their phone on Saturdays or their credit union won't pick their phone calls up after five o'clock. Well, in a competitive market like this, he's been converting buyers from other lenders and we don't have to do it. All we got to do is get the appointment to have him call and do not let them walk away with your lender's business card and say, call my lender. No, set up the time, put them together on a group text message, do whatever it takes, get them in contact because that's somebody else going to hold that lead in your funnel. See, and one of the other points that we like to do with that on on moving them from one lender to who our preferred lender is, is that we tell them, well, great, you're working with Quicken, Rocket, Spaceship, whatever you want to call it. And that's great. And you've been dealing with them and they have your they have your old loan. OK, great. I understand that. And so what I'd like for you to do is we're going to have you talk with our preferred lender. This is we'll go into you know, they've closed on time. They've done this, whatever that is. But the main thing is that my job is that the main thing is that I owe you a fiduciary duty and I would not be doing that if I knew that you could get a better interest rate or you can or something can work out better in your favor. So we're going to do this just to keep your quick and loans. We're going to do this just to keep them honest. OK, yep. because that's my job. My job is to protect you and what I want most from you is that I would prefer for you to go and tell everyone that you know that Cherie did a great job for me. And that's how that's how we kind of position a little bit more. And I'll, I'll add to that. We tell people because we get we get quick and we get State Farm Bank, we get USAA, we get Bob's Mortgage in, in Idaho, whatever it is. What I tell people oftentimes if they're using one of those people is, are you really going to trust the most important transaction that you're going to do arguably in the next five years to somebody who you have never even sat in front of them? What if something goes wrong and they won't answer your phone call? What if they get fired? What if this happens? For me personally, if I'm going to you know borrow two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, I want to be able to sit across from the person at their desk and have a conversation with them, not be put off by a telephone call. And it's amazing how often people are like, wow, I never really thought about that. And literally they're going online and they're using Linden Tree and Quicken and all these other things. And it, they have given that no thought and it's not a person. And, you know, and again, people get blown off because I don't know you. So I think that's another additional benefit that works. Now it doesn't work if they're already working with the local bank, but if they're working with one of the well, major lenders. It, it, it might in the local bank for this purpose too. Uh, the caveat that I'd like to add to that is this. Um, my lending partner, our lending partner, we're anywhere from 150 to 210 deals a year for that partner. And the chance of them doing something to screw up one of our relationships, if they do that, there's so much pressure for them to perform you're one customer to one lender. Uh, you're one customer. You're, you're 240 for, from mine. So um, or, uh, we're 240 for mine. So, you know, the, the reality is if you can position it, that my lender has so much pressure to perform because if he makes me mad, if he screws it up with you, he could screw it up with me and, and he's not going to want that. So uh, we've used that too, to get them to agree to an appointment. But if we wrap it all together, if we really you know, tie the conversation together, what we're talking about right now, if you can say, hey, I'm going to do you a favor and get you some numbers to keep your lender honest. Um, we're going to see, you know, if there's a, a second arrow in your quiver you can have, because if your lender is not available when you want to write the offer, why not have two pre-approvals? You can just jump to the next. And by the way, if you do use ours, here's the guarantee. 
they're going to, they're not going to screw anything up. If they do, they got to answer to me and I'm a lot of business for them. Those couple things together has made our conversion rate to our lenders extremely, extremely good. Absolutely. Now, a lot of people don't love this script. I know Brian, you're not in love with this script. No. I, I do. I love it. <laughs> if you want to lie, I use Michael's script. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> it's What's a bold faced lie, Michael. <laughs> it's not. It's not. That's the thing. Here's the thing. You've got to ask the question. It's not a lie. It's a question. And the question is, if they could save you a couple hundred dollars a month on your mortgage, would you be interested in chatting with one of our lenders? It's and a lie to say, hey, our lender's going to for sure save you a couple hundred so, bucks on your mortgage. So what, what do we? What do I say if I say, can he? Well, yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. Yeah. If, it, if he's working with Keller Williams mortgage, they're not charging any fees. They're not charging any back in. They're doing everything for free. Then yeah, the client's going to save money. So not I mean, 200 like bucks. what's that? Not, not 200 bucks. Uh, that's, that's that's on the price price. What's that? That's a, that's a point and a half difference. Okay. Understand? But it could be, it absolutely could well, be. Well, so let's say this, price. can he, I won't, can he, well, I don't quite know yet. However, it is my fiduciary responsibility to make sure right. that I at least line you up to get the best deal that you can. So give him a call. So no. All I'm saying is if you do that script to me and I go talk to your guy and he sends me, saves me 12 bucks, you just lost my business. <laughs> well, here, Brian, let, let, let me interject this. Uh, here's one thing that I've done is I've looked at the amortization. I've seen lenders as far apart as what, like a, a quarter point, a half point, mm -hmm. right? So position that over 30 years. If my lender could save you ten thousand dollars, you know now we're positioning over thirty, 30 years, and that's I, how I've done it. Because I like that's legit. Right to do that, then say that. If my lender could save you ten thousand dollars on your mortgage, would you be interested in chatting with them? Great, then use that. If you feel better about that, then use that. My point is that you have to put them in a position of they can't say no. You have to use something. That is, a, the, and my, I love it, but no X. Like, I freaking love that script. Thank you, Mike, Mr. Million. Uh, but, you know, the point is, again, you've got to ask questions that they absolutely cannot say no to. Now, before I forget, because we are literally almost out of time. We've got two minutes left. Uh, what I want to make sure that we share and, and that, I, that I highlight is we talked earlier about A team and B team, right? And this goes for whether or not, whether you have buyer's agents or ISAs, right? But at the end of the day, You've got to have an A and B team because not everybody's created equal. This is not a business where you're going to give participation medals, right? At the end of the day, there are winners and losers. There are better closers than others. And if you're not going to, you're, if you're just going to give your leads equally to everybody on your team, and regardless of their production, regardless of their close rate, you're going to make less money than you should. You're going to be less profitable than you should be. And you're not doing them a favor either. You're not going to help those little guys, you know, the guys that aren't the big producers, you're not going to help them make more money by giving them more of the good leads. That's not helping them. All that is doing is throwing away those leads because they're going to do what they have to do to pay their mortgage this month. And that's all they're going to do. They're not going to do more than that. So you have to stop worrying about hurting people's feelings and tell them the truth, right? Say to them, say, you know what? Gosh, darn it, John, I really want you to be part of the A team. I really want to give you more of these better leads, but I can't do that until you get your numbers up on the leads I'm already giving you. End of story. And if they can't accept that, they may not be a great fit for your team. They may not be the right person on your team. Um, and uh, Angela Cutter says, by the way, a quarter point rate on a $400,000 loan is $25,000 over 30 years. That's a great point, Angela. Um, so great. So use the number. Use the big number. All right. Good stuff. So everybody gets a chance to wrap up here. We've got uh, final thoughts. We'll start with Brian, then go to Sheree, then go to Mike. Final thoughts. So, you know, conversion to me comes in a couple of, at a couple of points and, you know, obviously Mike's um, eliminating the front end part of that, the conversion to the appointment. But I feel the reason that he's being successful is he's really got his agents and this is a, an area I feel like we're doing bad as an industry. It's conversion. Once I've met them, just because conversion to the appointment is great. Now I go out and I show you a house and never hear from you again, go out and show you a house, never hear from you again. But it feels like Mike's doing an amazing job when he's got his team doing an amazing job of the conversion from, Hey, I'm Brian until, you know, done showing the house and it, it, all those little things are so important. And here's the thing. If you spend all the money, if you spend all the time, you do all the effort to get in front of the person, don't let down then that's, that's you're, you're in the two yard line, push yeah. the ball over. And I, and I really feel like Mike's team sounds like Mike's team's doing an amazing job of that. So congrats. Mike. Thank you. Great point. Thank you for that, Brian and Sheree. So I was just on a call earlier uh, today with Amy Freeman's team and it's, and we were talking about the passing of the baton. So Mike, 
and longer bringing in the leads that Andy is converting to the appointments and he's passing the, the baton. So they're passing the baton along each way. You know, you think about a four by four race. Each time it's handed over and it's handed over and it's handed over all the way out. So one thing that um, I want for, and that was just a touch on your point there, Brian. But one thing is that this, the high ratio of the RDC leads, and I don't care if it was Realtor.com, if it was ZBuyer, if it was Zillow, if it was, make me moves. If it, I don't care what it is. The fact of make the phone call, go through, make the phone call, set the appointment, go through the discovery phase, show up, show up on time. And on time is 15 minutes early. If you guys don't know that show up on time, when you are there, start building their, building the rapport with them and show them more than one, show them what more than one come prepared, set yourself above every other agent that is out there. So our market is doing really good right now. People are buying houses. All of that is so great and fantastic. And what you guys need to remember is that that means that there's more agents out there. There's more agents out there than just the ones that were there before. I love it. Thank you for that. And Mike, you got to make it fast. We're literally out of time. We got to get on the coach's call. So give your last thoughts. Yep. So here's the thing. So to Cherie's point, one of the things too, don't, uh, we train our agents one hour every single week on conversion to closing from, from that appointment. When we get the appointment to closing one hour a week of training and development. The other thing is try to get them in the habit of setting the next appointment at that appointment. So in other words, you know, don't just say, call me when you see something you like. No, we're going to see houses again. I'm going to reserve a time for you on Wednesday. We'll find the houses to fit that slot, but I don't want to schedule over you. I want this to be your time that nothing else can take, take me away from your time. And even if there's not houses yet available, scramble to find one. If you can't find, we'll move the time again later. But again, get it in their mind. They're meeting you again. Right on, man. I love it. Thank you very much for that. And, you know, it's like, and to, to that point, Mike, it's like Brian always says, and he's right about this. It's not right about the script. But he's right about this, uh, that uh, at the end of the day, there's two acceptable outcomes. Actually, there's really three acceptable outcomes on any appointment, right? You're either set a next appointment, you write a contract, or you've decided you're done working with this person. Those are the only three acceptable outcomes. Correct. So that being said, thank you guys for being here. I love this. I love it when we have great conversation, especially when it gets a little spirited sometimes. I freaking love that. So that being said, have an awesome day. Remember, inside each one of you is a world-class beast just dying to get out. Jump on our link. If you want to get our deal on the Realtor.com leads, you can jump on our link. Go to www.clubwealth.com dot com forward slash r-e-a-l-t-o-r and if you are a club wealth member a club of coaching client we actually have specific deals for you specifically at realtor.com so have an awesome day everybody thank you so much for being here and we'll see you on the coaches call guys Bye.